So without further ado, um, I'm pleased to introduce our farmer presenter for this evening. So Chris McFarlane is part of a multi-generation mixed farm in Peterborough County. Since graduating from the University of Guelph in 2013, Chris has held jobs on both the livestock and crop sides of the industry, which proves he still doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up. Chris is a CCA and works off farm as a grain buyer. Tonight, he's going to give us a virtual tour of the cover crop he's been grazing with his cow herd. So with that, uh, let's start with the video farm tour. I'm Christine O'Reilly. I'm the forage and grazing specialist with OMAFRA, and I'm here with Chris McFarlane. Chris, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your farm? So this is McFarlane Farms. We weren't really original with coming up with our name. Uh, kind of a multi-generational mixed family farm. Uh, beef cattle, uh, cow-calf spring and fall calving, uh, grow corn, soybeans, wheat, and then a whole lot of hay this year that got wet. I also now have started into the crazy world of sheep. Uh, that's kind of mine and my wife Katie's project. How did you guys get into cover crops in the first place? Like, I know you guys also have a cropping operation as, yeah. as the livestock. So we started basically the most crop mixed with livestock grazing uh, was basically grazing corn stalks. Uh, once again, in this field, because it's right beside kind of our biggest pasture group um, and then across the road as well. So then it was like, well, rather than continuous corn, we've got other fields we can graze as well, actually get back into more of a rotation. Uh, so we ended up with a wheat field that we could throw a single wire hop fence around, kick cows out on. It's like, well, it's pretty easy to just go grab some oats, chuck them in a drill, and then, you know, basically get next to free grazing days for cows. Um, kind of a change in our philosophy on the cow side of stuff is I want to feed them stored feed as few days of the year as possible. Like that's kind of my goal. If actually going to make cows profitable in Ontario. Um, and when we have a cropping operation enterprise in the business and it's accessible and it's close by, it's almost a no brainer why I wouldn't try it. The other thing in this part of the world is we live on drumlins here. Uh, so we do have soil erosion uh, cause you know, uh, rain and runoff. So having roots in the ground obviously helps that situation. Uh, and we're trying to go to kind of more minimum tillage situation anyways, because tillage passes are expensive. So you've been grazing an oat cover crop for the last couple of years, and I know that's been working well. What made you decide to plant a more diverse cover crop mix this year? Uh, there's a crazy thing called the internet and Twitter where I get stupid ideas that I want to try something different. Um, so the Forage kale was more, I looked at crazy amounts of dry matter grown in New Zealand and I'm like, hey, might this work? So we tried that and then actually my the seed rep uh, suggested the hybrid brassica because he had a sheep producer uh, just south of Rice Lake here and grow it a few years ago with, with pretty good results. We'll see when they actually graze it, whether I'm gonna really like it or not. The other thing is, is as we were discussing earlier today, uh, with the straight oats as we run into a lot of uh, leaf rust issues uh, in this part of the world. So basically just trying to put another species in there that's not susceptible to maybe increase a little bit of forage quality, um, maybe a little bit extra protein. Uh, this, this crop here, we're gonna be grazing fall calving cows on. So while they'll be grazing this, we will likely be put, turning the bulls out uh, for, for breed up. So, you know, we, we have probably, you know, a really high nutritional demand, so try and you know, push some good forage into them late in the year when we can kind of grow it for basically the cost of the seed. So we didn't put nitrogen on this year for three reasons. Uh, nitrogen is exp expensive. Uh, we were way behind and didn't have our um, stuff organized. And behind us is way too much baleage that I don't really know what I'm going to do with otherwise. Uh, so I think we would see even like this pretty good you know, dry matter forage accumulation here. If I'd actually threw in even a little bit of nitrogen on, it probably would have been even more impressive, but you were asking about seeding rate. No idea. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I think the target was like 80 pounds of oats. And then first year with the brassicas through, we ended up putting them through the grass seed box. Mm -hmm. 
dad was planting and was monkeying around with it. So if we go through different parts of the field, it'll be a different percentage of the stand because he was trying to figure out, there, there's no forage kale rate chart for grass seed on a 1590 box drill. No, there wouldn't be. <laughs> so it was a little bit of trial and error. So I think one side of the field's a lot heavier than the other. Um, so we'll see when the cows get into it and if they're gonna eat it. So when you do turn the cattle out onto this crop, first of all, when are you hoping that's gonna be? Tomorrow, the next day. Okay. I'm just looking at the what, what we've got for grass ahead of them. Uh, this field's at kind of the, the back front corner of the farm because it's on the main road. Yeah. Um, so they kind of have to work their way back to it. Uh, the other challenge with it, and probably the biggest challenge for any cover crop grazing is water access. Uh, they pretty much have to go all the way back to the other side of the farm to get water um, as it stands. We might, because it's not freezing, actually bring up our spray water trailer uh, to just put water up here. You know, in our experience on this, you know, lush green cover, they don't really drink that much water, especially because it's not that hot anymore. Um, so if we bring, you know, a 1500 gallon tank up here in a trough, that'll do them a while. And I doubt they'll hardly even come up to the barn very much. How long are you hoping they're going to graze this? So my experience, what we've done on this basically is we pretty much just leave them on it. Uh, we also usually put them on later. We don't normally break fence it, although I was thinking this year I might just run one across. Uh, by the time we get on this, there's no regrowth. It's not like perennial summer grazing. Uh, and I guess my opinion is, is it's there. I might as well take it um, within reason. There's lots of root biomass underneath this. Uh, and then normally we'll leave them out up here and we'll actually basically bale graze with feeders mm -hmm. uh, and put them out. So they'll pretty much stay out here until there's enough snow that we have to get them out of here because the snowmobile trail goes right through this uh, field. Yeah. So uh, basically they'll be up here either grazing whatever they can pick off of it and or then, you know, supplemental feed with, with bales uh, pretty much until the snow gets deep. I did a clipping just from this one spot. So it's maybe not as representative of the whole field as it could be doing a few. She moderately cherry picked. <laughs> but we wanted just out of curiosity's sake to see kind of how, how much feed he's got out here so we can estimate how many grazing days he's going to get this fall. So to do that, I used a quadrat, so it's a 50 by 50 centimeter frame. I clipped all the forage that was inside that frame, filled up a big paper bag, and weighed it. Hold on, editing Christine here. We didn't do a good job on the math. We skipped some steps and we rounded and we messed up conversion between metric and imperial. So I've cleaned this up to help you understand the math so that you can do it on your own farm. But my advice is just don't do math in the field. Okay. So we had to take a guess as to how much dry matters in this crop. It's pretty wet. Uh, we've had a lot of rain. It's cool growing conditions. All of that means that there's going to be a lot more moisture in this crop than if we were doing something like this in, say, July. And brassicas are juicy. Brassicas are also very juicy. Yes, true. So just for argument's sake, we're going to estimate that the dry matter content is 20%. Um, so when we did the math, that worked out to being about two metric tons per acre dry matter yield. To get there, 600 grams times 0 0.2 equals 120 grams per quarter square meter. That's the size of the area that I clipped. I can quickly convert it to kilograms per hectare by multiplying by 40. So 120 grams per quarter square meter times 40 is 4,800 kilograms per hectare. But nobody thinks of their farm in hectares. So if we to convert that to acres, that's 4,800 kilograms per hectare divided by 2.47 gives us 1,943 kilograms per acre, which is almost two metric tons per acre. So how do we turn that into grazing days? We know that um, your, your cows are gonna have calved, so they're gonna have higher demand, so probably maybe 3% of their body weight in dry matter per day. Um, so, I mean, I don't have my calculator on me, but we could work out how much they're eating um, per day, knowing 3%, and are they, what, on average about 1,300 pounds? No, they're small? They're big? 
1,500 pounds? Uh, they're, well, they're fleshy because they're well looked after. Uh, so th this is kind of our least homogeneous group of cows we have. Uh, so they would probably average 1,437 if we want to <laughs> That's a very precise average. So we'll call it 1,400. So 0 0.03 times 1,400 pounds equals 42 pounds of dry matter per head per day. How many cows are in that group? Do you know, roughly? 35. 35, all right, about 35 head are in that group. 35 cows eating 42 pounds of dry matter per head per day gives us a herd demand of 1,470 pounds of dry matter per day. Because we did crop yield in metric, I need to convert that. So 1,470 pounds divided by 2.2 is 668 kilograms per day for the herd. Right, so then the last question is how many acres are in this field? 16. 16 acres times 1,943 kilograms of dry matter per acre gives us a supply of 31,088 kilograms. Assuming good ground conditions, those cows might actually eat 80% of what's out there. So 31,088 kilograms times 0 0.8 gives us 24,870 kilograms that they'll eat. Um, if we divide that by our herd demand, so 24,870 divided by 668 kilograms per day. That gives us a supply for 37 days of grazing. Cool, we've got a plan. All right, so we've been introduced to your farm operation, Chris. And if you're ready to share your screen there, We'd love to hear a little, little bit more. Good, okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, Christine edited it to make me sound moderately coherent. Um, <clears throat> so a few things I said we were gonna do, we didn't. So we're just gonna do a run through quick presentation here on crops. So the first thing, if you guys uh, don't know where we are, the little map dot there is uh, the field we were at. So. Uh, just inside Mater's Corners, southeast of Peterborough, just uh, north of Rice Lake, if that helps anyone. Uh, an area that traditionally has been pretty, uh, like pretty heavily with a lot of cows, uh, but those are leaving and more crops are moving in. Uh, so we're trying to do both at the same time. Um, normally Peterborough in the world of Ontario agriculture isn't that big, but uh, it is big in Omafra world currently because that's also where we're starting the new uh, soil survey. So this is the old soil survey map. Um, so we, just to kind of an idea of what we work with soil types, we're predominantly autonomy loams. Um, so as the presentation the video said, you know, sloping, uh, which we can leave to erodible knolls, which is part of the reason for looking at some more cover crop, uh, because a lot of times anymore are yield limiting for crops is moisture. Sometimes it's too mu much, sometimes it's too little. Uh, so extra water holding capacity uh, can definitely help, help that out. Um, so background about the farm, pretty simple. Uh, I have a little bit of a conflicting paradigm in how I'm feeding ruminants when I have uh, housed sheep, but then I wanna have cows outside as long as possible. Uh, that's a little bit different just because of I can accelerate sheep and get more lambs out of them. And I just so happened to buy a farm that had an insulated lambing barn I can use on it. Uh, and we've moved to a split fall calving uh, herd just from a labor perspective. Uh, we can calve on grass and we did have enough barns for all spring calving. Uh, if we weren't cropping, I would almost argue we'd be looking at backing up that spring group to calve on grass in May, uh, but we're busy in the fields so that doesn't really work. Um, so steps in how we've been grazing uh, cropland, uh, you know, grazing corn stalks, it's really simple. You basically combine the corn through a fence around it. It's pretty easy. They eat what they want. Um, we just started, you know, 
couple of years ago there with, with kind of really simple, put some oats in the field behind the shed and graze some cows on it. Uh, last year we added more acres. And then this year I decided to, uh, you know, try something a little bit different too. Um, so this is kind of what got me into trouble with Christine to make her think that I can actually do a presentation and know what I'm talking about. Uh, it was just on Twitter uh, of pretty cows grazing lots of green oats at the end of October. Um, I think that year basically was, was the same group of cows um, on about the same acres of just straight oats and they didn't eat anything else for 14 to 16 days. Um, so, you know, pretty, pretty good. Uh, last year, uh, we did even more acres. Um, actually, the field we were in for the video uh, is the field up in the background there on the hill to the left. Um, so anyways, this was across the road. So this, we actually did uh, work this last year um, because there was a lot of sprayer ruts uh, from the previous years. And, and we did actually do some uh, solid manure on it. Um, but once again, it was basically a, a straight oat crop um, with a few other things, odds and sods of seed put in uh, to grow. The difference in last year versus this year is September 19th, we got a killing frost. Uh, so that kind of capped what our dry matter accumulation uh, could be. Uh, that being said, we still got lots of nice growth. This is actually at a different farm uh, that we did. And we actually got oats to the point that they actually started to head out, uh, which, you know, is, is nice to say they basically kind of reached their, their life cycle. So, so this year was a little bit different. Um, it was our first using uh, attempt at using brassicas uh, to add a little bit of extra forage quality and diversity and just see what they're gonna do. Um, and, and because I was grazing these fall calving cows, I was looking for something other than straight oats that had a little bit more protein for them. Uh, as we all remember, getting wheat off this year took a while, so it kind of delayed in getting our cover crop planted. Um, so July 21st, uh, we took the, the wheat crop off, uh, as you can see here, but we didn't actually finish getting it planted until the 11th of August. Um, one is because we were fighting getting the wheat crop off in the straw bale, which was taking far longer than it should. And second of all, you can see in the bottom left of this, in the foreground of this picture, uh, one of our biggest problem weeds we're getting in our uh, cropping system that's fairly heavy with IP soybeans uh, is, is perennial sow thistle. Um, so it's starting to be a growing problem in that field. So I thought, you know, I'm delayed anyways, if I can get it, uh, a good burn down on it to try and get ahead of it, you know, so in two years from now, when I've got my, my IP soybeans back in this field, hopefully it's not as big of a problem. Uh, and I guess the side benefit was, you know, controlling some of that, uh, the volunteer wheat, uh, because just about every wheat seed that came out of the combine decided to grow. So here is the, the fledgling crop growing. Um, you know, the brassicas are coming up in the row. And then we're just going to kind of go through how they went uh, throughout the year. So, you know, we've got it growing and then it's thickening up. This was the other field we did at another farm with just straight oats. And you can very much see uh, it looks like combine wasn't set at all, but that's literally because it, the straw was raked and every seed that came out grew. So it definitely impacts uh, the cover crop establishment. Uh, because that thick mat of volunteer wheat just basically choked everything else out. Um, as mentioned in the video, you know, September, you know, we got into, into leaf rust in on the oats. But as the conditions went on, you know, it kind of stunts out and didn't grow as much and it didn't really hurt uh, the, the cows from eating it. Uh, the biggest thing we noticed this year, uh, adding the brassica is, without any extra nitrogen, was you know variability in in growth right so so this spot you can see everything's kind of stunted and, and not growing that great and not that far away we've got a crop that looks like this so um it'd be nice if it all looked like that but it's just not going to we didn't finally get the cows out on to till the 29th of october so that's awfully late this year uh but the open fall meant we had lots of grass ahead of them uh and I don't know. They just, that's when they got there. Um, in this, you can see the, the corn that was, you know, what we sucked out of the planter in the spring that we, we threw in. 
Uh, it got lightly frosted uh, and it kind of hurt the neighbor's sorghum, uh, but it didn't actually kill the oats or, or any of the brassicas. It wasn't cold enough. We did actually end up taking our water trailer uh, up there. She's a pretty simple system uh, with a two inch hose and you just fill up the 400 gallon trough. Uh, but those cows have not came back out of that field since we put them in there on the 29th of October. So it's worth a little bit of effort. Uh, we go out and check them every day anyways. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty easy. Um, so as you can see, you know, you can kind of lose the little calves in this because it grew lots. Um, as they've gone along, I didn't end up putting a break fence in. Uh, so they had all 16 acres. There's actually 39 pairs uh, in this field. Um, they basically went in and stripped out all of the oats first, because that's kind of what they knew what to eat. Uh, we finally got a killing frost on the 4th of November, uh, which has an interesting effect on some of the brassicas of, you know, they kind of changed their flavor profile apparently a little bit. Uh, so this is the 5th of November after the frost. They had actually gone in and then started to eat the brassica, but not the kale. Uh, and it kind of smelled after the frost a bit like a package of spinach that was left in the fridge a little too long. Uh, and this was this morning. Uh, they decided they did actually want to eat the kale. And as you can see, they've, they've mowed into it pretty, pretty good. Uh, here's, here's a picture of the kale they finally decided to chew on. You know, they've stripped the leaves off of it, uh, but the stock is still there, which is part of the reason why you can get those big dry matter yields on kale uh, that they get in New Zealand is there is a lot in that stock. Um, which they haven't quite got yet. I think Christine's, you know, 80% utilization rate was, was quite aggressive uh, for, for my system. So I'm not going to quite get the grazing days that, that she, her mass suggested, but she very much did cherry pick a spot that was one of those better, better uh, looking spots. Uh, so what did we learn this year? Uh, late frost really helps. Uh, if you can get an extra month longer than normal grazing season, we can sure grow some more feed, especially when we're using more non-determinant brassica type crops. Uh, diverse mixes, I, I would get better use of it, especially if I had either fewer cows in that paddock or a larger field to actually go out and do some controlled grazing, like put a break fence in. Uh, I wouldn't bother to back fence it because there's no point, it's not growing anymore. Uh, but because they're being a little selective, uh, if I was, you know, looking at a period where they were going to be more than, more than, you know, two weeks, it would probably be worth to, to do that. Uh, the cows milk great on the brassicas as well, so I'll probably look at doing something with it. Uh, and then even on the perimeter fence, uh, I didn't actually put it up. My, my father and my brother did. Uh, they hadn't really used a whole lot of geared reels, but uh, I told them just go buy another one to put it up faster. And they were shocked and amazed at how much faster it was. So uh, money, money well spent there because time is money. Uh, so how are we going to move forward in the future uh, for kind of these integrated system? The biggest thing I need to get set up is, is rotation field blocks of equal size. So right now I'm going to end up with uh, one year heavy corn access to corn stalks uh, to graze, you know, then the next year more, more wheat. Uh, and I'm not going to be able to get that set up. The other thing is when I'm grazing two to three years, you know, we can uh, probably we do a little bit more investment in even some perimeter fencing along the wood lots or, you know, some geared reels to whack up the fence fast. And the final thing, you know, is, is water sources. That's the big problem in a lot of this because crop fields don't really have uh, water by them, but uh, we'll see what we do. It'll, it'll be the big development to really make the, the whole system work. And I've already talked to you long, so that's all we've got for now. Thanks, Chris. And sorry if I talk too fast, but I usually do that. <laughs> I have the same problem. I'm also guilty of that. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got some questions coming in. Um, first one is, do you know if we should stay away from certain varieties if early frost is a risk? And do cows attack some crops after frost when the flavor becomes enhanced? Uh, I'm supposed to know the answers because I'm supposed to be expert. Um... <laughs> it's okay so if you don't. Yeah, so this is the first year I've really used the the brassicas, right? So uh, part of it's going to be a familiarity to them uh, of what they do know how to eat. So the first thing when I kicked in that field, there was like, what, a 16th of an acre of grass beside our, our bale yard. They stripped that down to a nub because that's what they were used to eating. And then they went and ate the oats and everything else. So um 
Yeah. And in terms of, of varieties for frost risk, that's part of the reason why I don't use sorghum in a, in a cover crop post wheat mix, um, just because it, I find it's not going to grow enough and it's so affected by frost. This year it would have worked because we got such a late frost, uh, but I would, I would for sure, you know, it's not really worth spending the money on to do that. Uh, that's part of the reason of looking at those, the cool season plants, the, the oats and the brassicas, uh, they can take some cooler temperatures and, and keep going, right? So if you do get, like we did last year, that September frost event, um, they can kind of keep growing through that if we get another warm spell. Whereas if you run into, if you run a lot of warm season crops in the mix, they, they're just dead, right? So. Yeah. Have you had any problems with the water tank freezing? No, it hasn't gotten cold yet. Um, in honestly, past years, have you had any problems with the water tank freezing? <laughs> uh, so, so in that, that's a pretty simple system. We just like, fill up the two inch hose. Uh, we have grazed them and it's, and it's froze, froze, you know, it's been minus five plus, minus five or lower with that. Uh, when we're just filling it once or twice a day, uh, yeah, there gets to be some ice cubes in it, but it's, it's not that big of a problem. Um, that group of cows actually will actually use that tank at the barn uh, with a heated water hose. And that's all we use all winter. Um, so it's not that, that big of a deal. And, you know, if it freezes a little bit, well, then you smash it or you throw the ice out of it. Um, like those, these cows, they can still get access. They can walk back through the pasture all the way back to the barn um, and get water if it's, if it's froze. Uh, once it gets like hard freeze and we're bail grazing them up there, um, we'll quit taking the tank up there and, and they'll just have to walk. Um, right now it's nice that they don't have to walk because it's really muddy on the path back to the barn, whereas that field's actually pretty dry. Um, so that, that comes back to my comments at the end about, uh, you know, developing a water system. If we had a, a winterized water back there, that makes it a whole lot easier to bail graze. Um, and especially, you know, the farm just to the south of this, you, you know, we, we own it too, luckily. Uh, and then there's, if I can get a water source, winter water source at the back, then I can actually do a lot more winter grazing that I can't otherwise, otherwise do. So that's definitely the biggest challenge. So yeah, the trough freezes sometimes, but smash it out or store the water tank in a shop. Okay. Um, was there much hoof damage in the field due to the wet fall? And if so, what, if anything, will you need to do to repair that damage? Uh, so walk across it today. I'm a little bit shocked and amazed how little damage there is. There is actually more damage in the pasture field that's below it that's actually wetter uh, than there is actually on this field. Now, that field is systematically tiled. So it is, it is one of the drier fields you have. It's on top of a hill that's tiled. Um, when we go into bale grazing them, yeah, we, they will punch it up, um, just because of, uh, pressure and there's, there's more cattle around the feeders. Uh, traditionally we basically just work it in the spring, uh, kind of spreads the manure out, spreads the leftover stuff, uh, and go from there. We haven't found too many issues. That field will be going into corn next year, you know, extra fertilizer is going to be worth a lot extra this year, given where, uh, urea is currently. Um, so we have not too many issues. Sometimes we'll have to do two, sometimes three passes to get it leveled up, but it's not the end of the world. We haven't really found too many long-term issues. The bigger challenge actually gets to be, uh, when we go to bale grazing is the pathway for the tractor to take the bales out, uh, actually is more of an issue than any cattle impact around the feeder or anything else. Um, you know, most the cow compaction is, you know, it's, it's really really shallow, right? They aren't heavy. So the freeze thaw usually takes that out. It's the heavy tractor machinery that's really going to cause the cause the damage. Okay. And I we've got time for one more for sure. Um, so you mentioned in the video tour that you didn't use nitrogen this year on the cover crop, but if, um, if cost wasn't as big an issue as it was this year, and if you'd had your ducks in a row the way you'd kind of hoped, uh, would you recommend putting nitrogen on a cover crop? Uh, or what are, what are your thoughts on putting nitrogen on a cover crop? Okay, so I'm not the uh, fertilizer is the devil type by any stretch of the means. 
Um, it has its place. Yeah, sure, I'd love to use less of it. Um, but when I'm like that mix was hybrid brassica, forage kale, and oats. All of those crops will do better with more nitrogen. Uh, I don't have any legumes in it to fix nitrogen. Uh, in the short season, these post wheat cover crops are growing, unless, of course, you're a Peter Johnson, let's plant red clover type. Uh, I don't know if they have a long enough time to fix a lot of nitrogen to even help out a companion. So yeah, for sure, if you can throw a little bit on it, you're going to get way more growth out of your crop. Um, it just amounts to is do you have enough acres and do you need if you need the extra expense, right? Um, you can definitely see the areas where you might say there would be kind of runoff accumulation of some extra nitrogen from the wheat crop, uh, just in the kind of gullies and stuff, and and the stuff there look way better. Um, so I, I guess the difference is is I'm treating this as a crop, not as a cover. Uh, there, there's a difference, right? So if I was just somebody that was going to, you know, I wanted to cover and I'm a straight crop person, not worth spending the money. If I'm growing it as a forage, then yeah, it's worth treating it like a crop and actually trying to get something off of it. And Christine's smiling at me. Uh, what I'm Cause it's annual forage. crops. It's annual forages. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Um, we're going to move on to our second speaker now, but uh, if you guys have further questions for Chris, he's available after the official program is done to, to chat a bit further about what he's doing and how it's working. Um, so thank you, Chris. Our second speaker is Dr. Jillian Baynard, who's going to give us an update to her integrated crop livestock systems research project. Dr. Baynard is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada at the Swift Current Research and Development Center in Saskatchewan. As a forage ecophysiologist, Jillian's research involves studying forage crops and the interface between plants and their environment. She works with forage breeders, ecologists, and animal scientists to develop forages that are beneficial nutritionally, environmentally, and economically. Jillian's recent research has focused on the use of forage cover crops in the semi-arid regions of Saskatchewan. She's also working directly with farmers to explore the impact and feasibility of grazing these cover crops. Jillian holds a PhD in botany from the University of Guelph. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jillian Baynard and uh, hear a bit more about her research. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And um, one thing I'm really pleased about is um, some of the questions I saw popping up in the chat and some of the things that Chris already talked about um, really tie in nicely with what I want to share uh, as well. So um, hopefully this is interesting and useful. Um, so as Christine said, I am based in Swift Current, Saskatchewan. So I know that's quite a different system than you have uh, in Ontario, but I do think there's a lot of uh, messages that um, carry across this system really. So Chris just gave an excellent definition and I wasn't even gonna put this slide in and then I thought, well, Maybe it's good to have it there just to make sure we're all on the same page for how I'm going to be using these phrases as well. So it's exactly as Chris said, a cover crop in the traditional sense of the word is grown simply to cover the ground, provide some benefits for perhaps the soil um, or the ecosystem at large, but you don't really have a tangible economic gain from it at that time. When we put it in a forage system, you might be able to still get those other benefits and then receive some value from that plant material by way of forage. When we put that into like an integrated crop livestock system, as we're talking about, the idea then is that you also get that added benefit of having, having animals on your land. So the addition of urea and manure, um, some of that hoof action maybe to bring some of that organic material into the soil. And so you might hear different phrases for these. Um, we, on the prairies, we'll hear a lot about polycropping or polycultures, sometimes cocktail mixtures. And the idea is that we're trying to also increase our, our diversity of plant life. And this increased biodiversity is suggested to have lots of different benefits. So perhaps higher productivity, um, you can improve your forage nutrition, increase soil health in quotations, because that means a lot of different things but um, you might improve soil water infiltration. Um, you might increase nutrient cycling or nutrient reserves. And then all of those things would hopefully lead to reduced inputs. 
Um, so as a scientist, as a researcher, part of my job is to kind of test these systems and see if these benefits actually are what we're seeing. So I've done a lot of different projects actually over the past few years. Um, and I have to kind of narrow it down for this talk. I don't have a ton of time, but we are trying to look at some of the different uh, implications of these systems. So from the forage side, the, the plant side, but particularly from the soil side as well. Um, and so we're having more and more data to sort of put together about that. Um, but the, the project I want to focus mostly on tonight is more on the animal side of things. Um, and so just to remind you, this background is swift current Saskatchewan. So it is a very <laughs> different system than the lush rolling hills um, from Peterborough. But um, we are in the brown semi-arid region of the southwestern Saskatchewan. Um, so it is quite a different system. A lot of my research is done in these small plots, which you can see in this aerial view. Um, but we also in uh, recent studies have been taking our research on farm and looking in bigger systems as well. So I wanna start, I guess I could have said this on my outline here. I just wanna give a quick summary of a few general things um, that I like to draw attention to. And then I'm gonna spend a little bit more time talking about our actual livestock trial. So just some general comments. First, I wanna talk about productivity. This is uh, exactly what you, the question was just about in terms of fertilizing these mixtures. Um, so this is the picture, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. because I was like, oh, I can actually talk about this. We do find first and foremost, I'll talk just about mixtures um, in terms of how many species to include. Mixtures do seem to improve biomass production compared to some monocultures. Now, if you have a really luxurious, vigorous growth on a monoculture, a mixture might not be able to keep up. But in general, we do see a little bit of an increase in biomass production when we have more diverse mixtures. And you can think of this in different ways, um, taking up more available space, taking advantage of the available light, the rooting zones, all of those different things. Um, I will caution, I'll say this briefly now, um, the more diverse seed mix you put in isn't necessarily what you're going to see. Um, so you, I've heard of farmers, you know, just putting in 12, 15, 18 different crops. And, and I would be a little bit skeptical if you're actually seeing the impact of all those different crops. Um, I show this here, this is about the fertility piece. So this was a, a very stressful field situation, stressful for the plants where it was zero inputs. Um, and we grew the same trials year on year. And what you can see in this picture is if you can look for the oats on the right and the left, the oats in the eight species mix, you can actually see them above the horizon, whereas the monoculture um, is, had quite a bit um, reduced growth compared to that mixture. And this is exactly what Chris was talking about, where we had legumes in the mix. And actually, we could see that beneficial nitrogen fixation and making more nutrients available. So, so this is a, an example of where um, that fertility piece is coming into play. With that said, um, I would also agree with Chris that if you are looking for production, fertilizer will still help. And I have some other data on that, but I'm not going to get into it tonight. One thing that is always important uh, for a farmer, of course, your crop is going to grow depending on weather and your conditions. And also, as Chris mentioned, even within a site, um, this is uh, some data taken by Charlotte Ward, who's with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, just showing that on the tops of the hill, uh, the mixture performs super poorly compared to in a lower, you know, wetter area of the field. And the other interesting thing to note is it's not just in terms of biomass production, which you can see as you look at these bars, right? They, the, depending if you're upland, mid-slope or lowland, you would have greater production, but also the proportion of those colors shows that different crops are going to perform better under different conditions. So again, that mix that you plant um, does not always look uh, the way that you wanted it to. So just a few more general comments. Um, the crops that are recommended by seed companies um, that come at least on the prairie, sometimes in a ready-made mix, they're not always going to be suited to your local conditions. Um, so I, I often recommend that people talk to their neighbors or someone else who's already trying to grow these things. 
uh, talk with your ministry reps or other local experts. Um, because otherwise, again, that, that represents lost value if you're seeding things that aren't actually growing. Um, of course, there's going to be the challenge of seeding crops with different seed sizes and seeding depths. So in the picture there, right, you have great big peas that need to be deeper, closer to moisture versus a tiny little seed like millet that needs to be quite close to the surface. Um, depending on your equipment could represent a challenge. If the conditions are right, you know what, um, I've had really good luck with things coming when I seed them at like an intermediate depth. But in a, a year with poor soil moisture, that's just going to add another layer of complexity. And then your seeding rates that you choose are not necessarily going to be representative of what comes up. Um, I know Chris mentioned the corn in his field there was just kind of some extra, you know, seed he had left. Um, corn is also one of those plants that doesn't really like competition. So I've actually grown it at a fairly heavy rate in mixture and had very poor very poor survival or productivity of it. Um, and so again, weighing out those pros and cons. Um, quickly about nutrition, forage quality can definitely be maintained or improved depending on what you put in your mix. This is just a very brief summary um, from one study where we had a monoculture oats crop and then we had a three, six and nine species mix. Those mixtures compared to the monoculture increased in all of those micro and major nutrients, and also the fiber um, went down. So the ADF and NDF was lower. So we had a more digestible forage. And TKN, the one in the middle there with the, the dark blue arrow, that is for nitrogen, which is how we calculate crude protein. And, and you can see it definitely increased as well. So depending what you're looking for in your nutritional profile, these mixtures, uh, you can definitely kind of work within that. Another comment, and this came up also in one of the questions, um, brassicas are definitely known to have toxic levels of nitrate and sulfate. So you would never want to graze these crops as a, as a monoculture. Whenever we've grown them in mixture, we have not personally seen any issue or grazed them, I should say, with toxicity. Um, but again, the awareness of the situation, and I'll show a little more of this in a minute, but in this example um, from uh, snowfall, following snowfall, the brassicas were one of the only sort of green things and, and could have been um, sought after at this time, depending on what other forage was available. So you really have to be aware that even though you may have planted it at a small proportion, it might end up representing more of the mix at a different point in the season. Quickly about weed control, because this is um, super important, I think. Um, the first bullet I have there is actually to say that some of these cover crop um, species, like forage radish, turnip, barley, and also we've grown triticale, they show really strong weed suppression. Some of it is their competitive ability, so putting up a nice big canopy, uh, competing for those light and, and moisture resources away from the weeds. And there is also some suggestion of allelopathy. So when the plants actually release uh, chemical exudates from their roots that other plants don't like. So we can actually see some pretty good weed suppression features for some of these crops. However, if your crop's not performing well, weeds can easily get out of control. And this quadrat in this picture um, was from this summer in Swift Current where we were experiencing a drought. And the plant in the very middle of the quadrat is a forage radish. Um, but everything, uh, and then up at the top of the picture there, you can see some barley and oats coming up and everything else is a weed. Um, we've got a huge problem with kochia and you can see some lamb's quarters in there and some red root pigweed. Um, and and it, it, I'll show you another picture of this. And then the lastly is some actual cover crops can become weedy. So there are concerns with hairy vetch. Um, it's not an annual as it's often marketed. It is definitely acts like a biennial and will persist in your stand. If you're using spray, um, you will be able to hopefully get rid of a good proportion of it, but we have seen it regrow. Again, in a forage setting, probably not a huge deal, but if you are doing this in an annual crop rotation, you will have issues with um, that seed being present uh, and it could 
cause some com complications. Okay, so I feel like I'm, I'm rushing through all those interesting parts, but feel free to ask me questions after about any of those details. But I do want to talk about this integrated crop livestock trial. So this project was funded by the Beef Cattle Research Council uh, and by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And it sort of came to be out of the BCRC researcher mentorship program, where new researchers are paired with people in the beef and cattle industry um, to learn more about you know, farming and the system. And it's a really, really great program. So I was paired with Sarah Sommerfeld, who's a Ministry of Agriculture rep and a farmer. Um, and this is her site up here in Outlook. And then the other one here with the arrow is Dwayne Thompson's ranch, who's in the picture there, very well-known rancher um, near Kelleher, Saskatchewan. Then we have Swift Current down here in the corner with the Canada flag. And then the Manitoba Beef and Forge Initiatives also has a research farm in Brandon, Manitoba, where we had a fourth site. Very short story, Outlook and MBFI had some very tricky problems with weeds. Um, so for this talk tonight, I just want to focus on Swift Current and Kelleher uh, sites to talk about. In this trial, we had, uh, again, this was an annual crop system. So our kind of our control or our comparison was just a standard annual crop rotation with no livestock. And then we had a simple mix that just had two crops of oats and peas and a complex mix that had eight different crops growing together. So um, a, part of this study is an economic component to even just see sort of producer willingness to adopt in terms of starting with a basic mix versus something more complicated. So we first grew this in 2019. So that's the results I'll share first. In Swift Current, as I mentioned, we're in the brown soil zone, um, very dry. And it, it, at our research farm, we're running at what we just consider probably a conventional grazing system. So looking for a smaller number of animals per unit area for a, a longer period of time. What we did is we set up small paddocks, um, about one and a half acres in size, and we had eight yearling steers on these paddocks. Here's what happened. So um, if I think all the way back to 2019, so much has happened since then. We did have quite a dry summer. Um, especially through and spring, so in through June and July. And towards the end of July, we said this crop is not, um, oh, I should have said this, let me back up. In Ontario, where you have a, a better growing season, um, uh, as Chris was discussing, you could definitely treat this like a relay crop, right? Where you grow your cash crop and then follow it with a cover crop. In Saskatchewan, that's very difficult based on our growing season. So this is a full season cover crop that we put in in the spring and then let it grow and then grazed it. So as I was starting to say, by the beginning of August, um, the things were starting to dry up and we said, let's get these animals out there. The, this is the simple mix. So there you can see our dry matter production there, just under 4,000 pounds per acre. Um, the steers were not really enjoying their time. Um, and I'll give a couple of stories about that, but we took them off after about six days of grazing. Um, the nice thing about in a research farm setting like this, we could actually get weight data and they were losing about two pounds per day. So based on those um, number of cattle and the unit area, we got about 28 grazing days. On the complex mix, we had higher dry matter production. We pushed the steers longer. We kept them on for eight days, which gave us 39 grazing days, but they were overall losing approximately four pounds per day. And that's obviously not what you wanna see. Now, what you may be noticing in these pictures is there's still a lot of plant material there and we were trying to push them to eat it. But as has already been mentioned by Chris and in the chat, we had major, major issues with preference and palatability of the forages. So this is the complex mix here uh, on the left. And you can see there's a lot of green brassica material, but they did not, did not enjoy it at all. Now this is, these are naive animals, right? Where um, prior to this, they would have been on a mixed grass pasture. So this was very foreign to them. I also just wanna point out 
on the simple mix, on the, the picture on the right, you can see our electric fence running there through the middle. And that's our annual crop. It was an agronomic pea crop grown for just for peas. And you can see there's a nice big row of it. And I know it's not like a forage pea, but these steers wouldn't even touch it. And even in the oats and peas mix, they were not eating the peas um, at the, these early stages. What we had was sort of a staggered grazing. So they went on that first area. And then, like I said, we, we took them off. Some animals then stayed on and we opened up another section of this pasture and then a third section. And the promising story is the longer the animals stayed on, they definitely started gaining weight. And I think there's two, two reasons here. One is that they became, well, maybe three. One, they became more used to the um, unusual forages. So they just got more comfortable eating it. Two, when we reduced their, the stocking rate, they could be even more choosy, right? So I do think they were cherry picking all the oats and barley and the things they did like, and there was just more of it to go around. Thirdly, seasonality. Um, as was mentioned, these brassicas do uh, get sweeter following frost events. So later in the season, they were actually much more palatable. So you can see this third section graze would have been the most mature stand. And, and uh, at that point, it got grazed down quite evenly. Um, the animals that had gone and came back still lost weight, but the ones that stayed on started gaining around three pounds a day on simple and two and a half day, pounds per day, sorry, on the complex. One other quick note, notice in the first section graze, that's where it looked so bad a few slides ago. We did get rain in August and then we do start seeing regrowth. So again, the steer in the picture there is actually quite happily eating it but you would want to be a little bit aware of what else is available for feed. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to jump into Kelleher here. Totally different farming operation. It's um, in the parkland region, so we have um, black soil, much higher seasonal moisture, and Duane runs an intensive rotational grazing system. So he had about 1,100 cow-calf pairs and bulls that mob grazed uh, a pasture of 16 acres, which was half seeded to the simple mix and half to complex. Duane always uh, is disappointed that I show this picture of a bull. He said, <laughs> it's not very flattering, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but just to show you the production, I don't know if you can see this, this tiny little black speck in the field there, that's my student. And you'll see when the uh, livestock are in there, like huge production, very, very lush crop, really high. Um, and better, much better production than we saw in Swift Current, as you can see from those values. Preference, the cattle definitely still showed a preference for the simple mix. It was grazed down first, but in this intensive system, they put their head down and they eat what's in front of them. Um, and they grazed everything down. And based on, they were there for two full days. So based on the area and the number of animals, it's about 92 grazing days per acre. They left a nice, layer of litter. This was quite quite heavy, heavy utilization, probably at least 80 percent, uh, but there is still a fair bit of litter remaining. Jumping ahead, I just want to quickly share with you what happened this year when we did the exact same thing again for a second time. Swift Current. Unfortunately, you may have heard we were experiencing a very considerable drought um, and we had very poor crop production, which resulted in like ridiculously bad weeds. So in this picture here, this was the simple mix. Um, you can see sort of the lighter dead areas. That's where the actual crop was, which was quickly grazed and gone. And most of the green stuff you're seeing are weeds. So the production value on both the simple mix and the complex mix was quite low. And know that that um, production um, dry matter yield includes the weeds, which were about 40 to 50% of some of these pastures. So just very, very bad. Our hope was that they would actually graze the kochia, which can be used as kind of an emergency feed. They did top it, but they, did, they were not interested in, in grazing it. So they only, we had 10 animals for 10 days on about four and a half acres. Um, so we only got 23 grazing days and they were losing on both the complex and the simple. Again, if we could keep them longer, 
perhaps we would have seen gains, um, but it just, uh, everyone was just getting a little bit uncomfortable with the situation. So we just moved them to a different, uh, a different pasture. So definitely highlighting um, what I would call one of the, the pitfalls or potential risks. Mm -hmm. Kelleher, a little better. Um, moisture, they were definitely drier than average as well. But I did want to say this is a different way this system can be used. This year, Duane wanted to do a twice over grazing scenario. So the crop was grazed early in July. So you can see there the production values were lower, but it was not at peak biomass. So we got a one and a half days for 600 pairs. Um, that's again on about 16 acres. And you can see that's a, a grazing exposure we have there. You can sort of see what potential biomass was there and how they grazed it down. Um, and that is in early July. And then here's what the crop looked like in October. So they did get a considerable amount of regrowth. Um, there you can see the production values from the end of September. Um, and this next round of grazing has not yet taken place. It should happen any day. I'm waiting to hear from Duane um, to know how, how long he can keep them on there. Uh, but it definitely shows another scenario if you're moving animals um, that you may be able to come back over some of these, these crops. So take home messages. Um, definitely, as with all farming, right, production potential definitely can be limited by weather and site conditions. Um, so to be aware of some of that variability on your farm and then with growing conditions, you're, you're open to uh, different types of risks, I think, because of the diversity of your mixture. Now you will hear too in a bad year, some of these crops may actually, um, you know, perform better because you have this diversity. So if something's dying, something else might be growing. Um, but do recognize that overall you have some other challenges, especially related to weeds. So pay attention to agronomic management, obviously, right? And in terms of rotation with an annual crop, um, there is the potential for some pathogen buildup. If um, you know, you have legumes in a mixture and then you follow with a legume annual crop or same thing for um, a brassica, for example. And then I have this uh, Sarah Sommerfeld. So she was one of my other collaborators, as I mentioned, and mentors. She said, be flexible, be adaptive. It is okay to fail. Challenges are not only physical. Um, this, could, this was quite stressful um, in, in her situation. So she said, be prepared for human challenges. So not to say that these won't work and aren't working, but just to be aware of some of those challenges, I think is kind of part of what I wanted to highlight, uh, at least for the prairies. Um, so just quickly, um, I can't do any of this research out without a huge amount of support from my staff, um, summer workers and students, and then of course the farms and teams that collaborated with me and our funders. Um, I'll just put up my email address here. Thanks again for listening. Um, I look forward to chatting now and, and answering some questions, but certainly um, I'm very open to anyone contacting me by email as well. So feel free to reach out. All right. Thank you so much, Jillian. Um, I think for the sake of time, we'll field one question now, then I'll do the formal wrap up. But then, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're all welcome to hang out for virtual coffee and cookies and uh, Jillian and Chris can field some more questions then. So, um, are you aware of any studies on cross seeding? So drilling at half the rate, but doing it in two passes. So you end up with the same full rate and that might be at a 45 degree angle or a 90. So you're, you're changing the spatial distribution of those plants at seeding. Right. So um, I don't have any like specific data, but I definitely know of, um, uh, of people who have done that just two passes. So do one, for example, with the big seeds and then a second pass with small seeds can certainly work if you're willing to put in the tractor hours. Um, but that is one way to get around the, the different um, seed sizes and depths for sure. Sorry, Christine, are you able to stop my slide share? I can't seem to, to find where to do that. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> James did that. <laughs> I was looking for oh, the button. Thank you. I was it. trying to, to manage. <laughs> yeah, no worries. All right. So this brings us to the end of our official program. 
I want to thank Chris McFarlane and Dr. Jillian Baynard again for taking the time to speak with us this evening and get this year's renewed conversation around cover crop grazing rolling. Um, and we, we really do appreciate you both staying on for further chat after I finish the official spiel here. Um, I also want to thank Beef Farmers of Ontario and Ontario Sheep Farmers for helping us put together this webinar series. And finally, we're going to be back with the next installment, same time, same place next week. So that's Tuesday, November 16th. Um, we'll be joined by Steve Sickle, who's a farmer from Brant County, and Dr. Mary Janoski, who is a professor and beef spe system specialist at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And they're going to be talking about how cover crop grazing impacts soils and subsequent crop yields. So we hope to see you back here next week.